Hi, Stephen from Owner Disso. Recently, I reviewed the Dell G5. Now, that had an RTX 2060. It was a nice laptop, but at the time, it was rather overpriced and had poor air ventilation. Now, the new G7 is $100 more expensive, but I think it is actually worth it because it has a total aluminum build, while the G5 had a plastic lid and a plastic bottom cover. The G7 is also slightly thinner at 0.78 inches or 20 millimeters and is available as a 17 inch as well. It's also quite portable with a weight of five pounds, nine ounces or with the 180 watt power brick, seven pounds. My model has a six core i7-8750H CPU, has one stick of 16 gigabytes of RAM running single channel and an RTX 2070 Max-Q and a 512 gigabyte PCI Express Toshiba SSD, which has decent read speeds, but the writing speeds were quite low. My panel is a 144 Hertz IPS one. Its colors are quite decent with 91% of sRGB and at 340 nits, it is plenty bright. It does have slim bezels, but the surrounding lip that protects the screen when it is closed, it does feel rather loose and cheap. Now the webcam is up top. This is what the 720p webcam looks and sounds like. This is what it's like when you're typing. I was also very impressed with the very minimal backlight bleed. And in my ghosting test, it performs about the same as the 144Hz Razer 15. Now you can configure with a 90 watt hour battery and forego the spinning 5400 RPM mechanical drive. Otherwise you get the 60 watt hour battery. Now, I was able to get five and a half hours of runtime. That was streaming YouTube at 25% brightness. This was about two and a half hours less than I saw with a 60 Hertz panel in my G5. The base model starts with an i5 and a 1050 Ti for $1,150. And my model was $2,400. Fortunately, they currently have a 17% discount going on, bringing my unit to about $2,000, which is much more realistic. You get some decent ports too. On the left, we have an exhaust vent, Thunderbolt 3 and one of three USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type A's with power share and a combo headphone mic jack. Dell use their hinge forward design to accommodate bigger rear heat sinks. They also have some uh, good ports around the back, including the, the power, HDMI 2.0, USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type A, mini display port, gigabit ethernet and a wedge lock slot. I really do like having these ports here as it does help keep away the, the wires away from your hands. On the right there is a 2-in-1 SD card multimedia card slot, a, th a third USB type A port, a fourth air vent and a heatsink. The aluminium keyboard base is nice. It uses a Windows position trackpad which is smooth and although it is smaller than the G5 it works well and has integrated mouse buttons. The keyboard is the same as the G5. Now, my unit has a four zone RGB lighting. The separate number pad is good and I like the one button press for changing key light brightness or adjusting the volume. Now, unlike the Alienware M15, there are no air intakes above the keyboard, but it still, it looks classy. And in the center, there is the power button that doesn't double as the fingerprint reader. Although I have heard that it does in Europe. I also like the aluminum lid that makes the laptop suitable for a business setting with the Dell logo reflecting light nicely. Now, like the G5, you remove Phillips screws to remove the aluminum back cover, which is nice and solid. Here is the 90 watt hour battery. And if you have the 60 watt hour one, the hard drive would be here. It's easy to disconnect should you decide to upgrade the RAM to dual channel because by default, you only get one stick. The SSD is half size, but there is a sliding mechanism to allow for full size cards. And here is the killer 1550 Wi-Fi card and the GPU and the CPU exactly the same as the G5. You have two separate heat pipes with two shared ones leading to four heat sinks and the speakers are firing at the front downwards. And indeed, the speakers are actually pretty good. They didn't sound tinny at all and were quite loud at 82 decibels. The software allows you to optimize battery life and choose one of four power modes. You also have the Alienware command center that allows you to change the RGB lighting look at CPU and GPU clock speeds and temperatures, and also to adjust audio effects. Finally, they have a Dell update program, which makes checking for updates very easy. Now, fan noise is not bad either. Even under full load, we are only at 45 decibels in quiet mode or 48 decibels in ultra performance mode. Now, despite only a 180 watt power brick and a power pull of 170 watts, I didn't see the battery discharge 
unlike the G5. As for the temperature of the chassis, I did find that the AWSD keys did get quite warm when the CPU was at 100 degrees Celsius. Underneath, it gets fairly warm at 50 degrees when under full load. Now, but for general use, it was fine. Now you can see warm air being expelled out the right hand side towards your mouse hand, but note that very little air is actually blown out of the left hand side heatseek where the CPU is. The same seems to be true out the back. M much more hot air is blown through the GPU heatsink than the CPU heatsink. Now this may explain, you know, in part, why the CPU runs at 100 degrees uh, Celsius under uh, ultra performance mode. I don't recommend using cool mode for anything. It just basically slows everything down. And in CPU work like handbrake, it slows the CPU by 20%, pulling 44 watts versus 86 watts, either in optimized or ultra performance modes. In gaming, you will get frame rates in the teens. Optimized mode doesn't do much in the way of affecting speeds or reducing temperatures. I used a regular ultra performance mode for all of my testing, uh, but did do some tests using the quiet mode as well. Now, as you can see here in Rainbow Six Siege using uh, ultra settings, quiet mode makes the CPU pull about 35 to 40 watts versus 60 watts in ultra performance mode, and thus reduces temperatures quite a bit. But you still see the odd spike to 96 degrees. The frame rate is not negatively affected either. Now here is Battlefield 5 using Ultra Settings and DX12, again in quiet mode. The CPU averages 85 degrees, but again sees spikes to the mid 90s. The CPU clocks down to around about 3100 megahertz and 35 watts. It's certainly a good option to use for those that don't like using third party software like Throttle Stop to adjust clock speeds or to undervolt. But it's not the holy saviour. In some games like Far Cry 5, after a long gaming session, the CPU still peaks into the mid 90s. Now, putting, on a, putting it on a cooling pad, using the quiet mode does help cool it down, but switching it to ultra performance mode, the cooling pad has little effect. So my preferred option is to use throttle stop uh, to set the clock speed to 3700 megahertz and do an undervolt. For the GPU, I overclocked the core by 147 megahertz and the memory by 547 megahertz. Assassin's Creed with single channel on the left, the CPU barely pulls 30 watts and runs around the 3000 megahertz mark. Now switching to dual channel sees a big increase in CPU clock speeds, wattage and thus temperatures. But you do get a big increase in frame rate. Now comparing the G7 in orange to the equally equipped Aero 15 in blue, we see that the performance in dual channel mode is similar. However, if you don't upgrade the RAM, then you lose a lot of performance, even against the competing single channel systems. In Battlefield 5 DX11 Ultra settings, we have single channel on the left. Dual channel on the right sees a big frame rate increase and also the CPU now pulling about 60 watts, which is too much to cool. Now remember, this is using the ultra performance mode though. Using my throttle stop and overclock settings, the CPU maintains a steady clock rate and about 40 watts excellent thermals and a boost in frame rate. Switching on ray tracing uh, using single channel on the left, again we see the CPU working harder with dual channel on the right. Improved frame rates at the expense of more heat. So I suggest using either the quiet mode or my throttle stop settings. Compared to the Aero 15, we actually, actually see better performance in dual channel and about the same in single channel. Overclocking the GPU had neg negligible effect here. Far Cry 5, using ultra settings, even in single channel, the CPU is pulling up to 55 watts and steady 100 degrees Celsius. Now I recall the keyboard getting very warm and uncomfortable to use here. Now on the right, we have the same settings, but this time tweaked with throttle stop and MSI afterburner. We get a better frame rate and much uh, better temperatures. And unlike the quiet mode, which still peaks in the mid 90s, the highest I saw here was 85 degrees. Comparing it against the Aero 15, performance isn't too much different. It's clear though that you do need the dual channel RAM to see the best out of this game. PUBG using ultra settings with single channel on the left and dual channel and tweaked on the right. Um, single channel runs quite cool, but without my tweak in dual channel, it runs in the 90s. So it's definitely worth doing and we see a very nice boost in frame rate. And compared to the Aero 15, we see similar performance and a slight increase when overclocked. In Fortnite, we see the same trend with a 20% increase with dual channel and performing on par with the Aero 15. 
Now, if your workload can make use of these tensor cores on the RTX graphics cards, then you will see huge benefits. And in fact, the 2070 Max-Q here matched the laptop 2070 and annihilated the GTX 1080 in my V-Ray benchmark. Unfortunately, if you plan on using the G7 for real-time audio processing, Latency Mon reported a couple of drivers causing too much latency, so it may not be suitable for you. The rest of the benchmarks are pretty good. Cinebench R20 is a new one, and that stresses the CPU much more than the R15. Here are the 3D marks for Firestrike, Time Spy, and the Ray Tracing Port Royale. Now, these scores are using dual channel RAM, and it is a solid performer. Now, all of my results are available via an Excel sheet in the link in the description below, but here I summarize the clock speeds, the power usages, and the temperatures for both the CPU and the GPU. Now, single channel is in orange, dual channel is in green, and dual channel but tweaked with the throttle stop and MSI afterburner, that's in yellow. Now, the top two charts are for the CPU, both averaged and max. The CPU sees an increase in average clock speed, watts, and temperature when switched to dual channel. Now, looking at the peak readings, the CPU even pulls up to 70 watts in dual channel, and this is while gaming. We really want this to be no higher than 45 watts. Now, quiet mode does reduce the clock speed and the power usage, but for long-term use, it's not really enough. My tweak reduced temperatures by 10 to 13 degrees Celsius, whilst also increasing uh, the average CPU clock rate. Now, the GPU runs pretty cool, peaking at 77 degrees. That's some 10 degrees below the throttle uh, temperature threshold. Now, dual channel does increase its temperature slightly, but even when overclocked, when you reduce the CPU temperature, the GPU is cooler than even the single channel, whilst also having a better boost clock. Now, do I prefer the G7 over the G5? Absolutely. It has larger air intakes underneath, and for an extra $100, you get uh, a more premium build. I really did like the G7, its only shortcomings being that uh, Dell pushes too many watts to the CPU in auto performance mode, making it unusable for, for the long term. Now quiet mode does help, but it's still not 100%, so we probably need a BIOS update to limit the watts further. Now it is a shame that it seems that the CPU fan isn't pushing as much uh, air out as the GPU fan is, so perhaps that is part of the problem. The keyboard, trackpad, and the screen are great. I also really like the speakers and the webcam and the mic, you know, they're pretty decent as well. Now that the Dell is actually reducing the pricing, I would recommend the G-Series. Now just make sure you do plan on uh, your budget on buying more RAM though. And if you're new to my channel, make sure to subscribe. I'd like to thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye.